All right, everybody, welcome once again. It is Wednesday night, which time for another chance to visit the Red Delta Project podcast live stream Q&A. As always, I'm your host, Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project and author of the books that sponsor these episodes, which are down below. You can find them, Grind Style Calisthenics, Smart Bodyweight Training, and the brand new uh, book that just came out literally like 24 hours ago, my new book, Micro Workouts. Micro Workouts is basically my collection of strategies on how to make your workouts as straightforward, focused, and effective as possible. And as a result, you don't really need to spend nearly as much time, energy, and or money doing the things you think you need to do, which really aren't all that important. So brand new book. It's only available in Kindle format in the, uh, the time being, largely because in order for me to do the physical ones, I need to order proofs and get them from Amazon and then order more proofs. And the shipping and everything is just taking forever. So hopefully I will have the physical books out by mid to late January, but I wanted to at least get the Kindle version out for you. You folks to enjoy. So, all right, what are we talking about today? I know it's a bit of a vague, almost clickbaity title, and for that, I do apologize. I try to stay away from that sort of thing. But what we're exploring in this episode and in a couple of other ones, uh, depending on uh, what I can research, is flawed premises in fitness, flawed foundational ideas on how fitness works that basically when we adopt these as our foundational approaches to how we think that diet and exercise and building muscle and stuff works, then all of the choices and decisions you make from there on out have a little bit of a crack in the foundation. They're not necessarily wrong. They may not even be necessarily bad, but they are a little bit on a weak foundation. It's kind of like building the leaning tower of Pisa. You know, half of it's on a, a more sandy foundation as a result to keep uh, going more to an angle and it gets more pronounced the higher you build. So these premises that we often go into, every time you hit a Google search, every time you're trying to find something on YouTube and saying, okay, so I want to lose weight. I want to build muscle. I want to get better results. How many reps do I need to do? How many calories do I need to eat? How much protein should I eat? These are the questions that are usually very indicative of what I call a formulaic approach. A formulaic approach is something that makes total sense on the get-go, but it doesn't work very well in fitness much of the time. The reason is because a formulaic approach is based on the idea that we can, quote, engineer fitness. This was a lesson that came up from Dan Vinson over on his podcast. He was interviewing, uh, I'm afraid I don't remember the name, but uh, a gentleman the other day is like, when we're dealing with fitness, this is way different than engineering. Because in engineering, you can plug in consistent variables and get a consistent result. You know, A plus B equals C. Whether you're building a toaster oven or a jetliner, you put in A and B, you're going to get C together in the given scenario. But when we're dealing with fitness, we're not dealing with engineering. We're dealing with biology. And with biology, it's not nearly as consistent and reliable as we often think it should be. So you add A plus B and you're going to get C sort of, uh, much of the time, but we're not really sure. And there's other compounding variables, but it also depends on these other situations. So we need to do more research. That's how biology works. So you can see this rampant throughout fitness where people will apply an engineering approach of this is how many calories you should be eating. This is how much protein. This is how many sets and reps you need to be doing. This is the order you do your exercises. Like it's very structured, very logically thought out and everything. And as a result, they're like, well, I should go X, Y, and Z and be at the result I want by this time. And this is actually a strategy I've seen people use in uh, as a sales tactic. I was once interviewing at a gym as a, as a trainer and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, the head trainer, the, the coach there said, oh yeah, we have this formula. So you plug it in, like how many times they work out, what's their caloric intake, and this is how long it will take them to get to their body weight. So we can tell them you will be at your goal weight by this date. And I asked him, I was like, does that really work? And he's like, oh yeah, sure. It sells packages like crazy. We sell a ton of personal training with this. I'm like, no, 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 no. That is a sales tactic. Like, does it really work for people? Do people actually follow the plan and get that result reliably by that date? And he's like, oh, hell no, never works. It's very, very rarely. Some people are further along. Some people fall short. Most people don't even get close to that and give up along the way. And as a result, 
it really highlights this idea of like, we want to be able to apply a special formula or even a number, like how many sets and reps should I do? How many calories should I eat? What should I do? Give me the specific numbers. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there, right? And they get lots of views where in the thumbnail, they like exact sets and reps you need, exact formula, exact workout you need to follow. And make no mistake about it, they're guessing. It's an educated guess at best. Now, don't let me discourage you from looking for these numbers, right? How many calories you eat, how much protein, how many sets and reps. These aren't bad places to start. They're good for maybe getting you in the general ballpark of things. But where we go awry is when we look for that one specific number or formula and we're dogmatic about it. Like, this is the number I need to follow all situations, no matter what. And even if their lifestyle changes, even if their circumstances change, even if their goals change, they still stick to this number like glue, even though it may not be the best formula or the best numbers for their circumstances. So that's why things like adaptive training that I go over in my book, micro workouts, and having a flexible approach to diet and stuff is very applicable because when we are using a flexible approach, we can always change those numbers based on what we actually need because those numbers are an estimated guess at best. Every workout, every dietary recommendations, everything you ever find from a blanket question of what should I do? How many should I do in this? It's an estimated guess because there's so much nuance to it. There's so much circumstantial uh, influences that come into the picture that can alter what you actually need. And if you don't know that, then you could potentially be like, I eat exactly the right number of calories. How come I'm not losing weight? Or I did 10,000 steps a day. How come this isn't happening? Or I did the right sets and reps. How come I'm not building muscle and stuff? And that unfortunately is the more common outcome is we do the formula, we don't get the result, and we think the formula is wrong, and then we find a different formula, right? What's the latest research say and everything? We don't recognize that the whole point of those numbers is an estimated guess at helping you achieve the fundamental principles of fitness. So that's why I addressed it in the previous episodes where I talked about the numbers you follow aren't really that important. It's more of what is the objective of what you're trying to do. Like when you're doing your workout, what are you? What kind of a stimulus are you trying to create? <coughs> Excuse me. What kind of a stimulus are you trying to create with your exercises? Because once you understand what that stimulus is, and that's what micro workouts is all about, then you have a much more direct line into what's actually going to work for you, right? So the analogy I give is like trying to drive a nail into a board, a plank of wood, right? Now the objective is we want to drive the nail all the way in so it's flush with the board. Okay, that's the objective. And when you know that, you, what you do, it's like, I'm just going to use whatever methods and whatever hammer I've got and hit it however many times it takes to accomplish that objective because I know that's what's important. But when we have that formulaic approach and we're going solely by the numbers and you find on the internet it says in order to drive a nail into the wood, you need to hit it exactly nine times. Don't hit it 10, don't hit it eight. The research is very clear, hit it exactly nine times. Well, what are the chances that's going to be the right number, right? There's so many ways that depends on the nail, depends on the length of the nail, depends on the wood, depends on how you hit it, depends on your hammer, depends on so many different things. So nine times is a guess. Now there's always gonna be those out there who will hit it nine times or do so many calories or so many sets and reps and it's going to work just magically out of luck. And they're going to say, oh, wow, okay, that's the number. And then they're going to go on and say, that's the right number. That's the correct way to go about it and so on. But when we have an objective of hit the nail flush or make sure you're creating time under tension, progressive time under tension, right? Make sure you're practicing the proficiency of what you're trying to do or make sure you're just burning galleries, which is the easiest one to do. Those are the three objectives in your workout. They're pretty simple. And you can do whatever you want in your workout to accomplish those. I don't give a damn what your workout looks like. I don't care how many sets and reps and order of, I don't care what exercises you do. I don't care what sort of format you do. It's basically, as long as you're creating more time under tension, you're creating a demand for muscle growth. As long as you're practicing and becoming more proficient at the, at the skills and performance, you're going to get better at it. And as long as you're just doing anything at all, you're going to be burning calories. So we don't necessarily need to rely on formulas and put them in charge. We use them, like I said, to get us into the general ballpark. Then we base those numbers on, well, how well is it helping me to achieve that objective of creating the stimulus or helping me to cut back on how much I'm eating and all sorts of things like 
you know, is it more protein than normal kind of thing? Like how much protein should I eat? I don't know. Get to your normal place and then increase it and see if that helps at all, right? That's what uh, the best ways to go about it rather than putting a number in charge, which is oftentimes an estimated guess at best. So that's the formulaic approach. Numbers aren't bad, but they can be a little misleading and we shouldn't put them in charge. We should instead always be manipulating them. Next week, I'm going to be looking at something I call the mechanicalistic approach, where we get fixated on one physiological process and think that's the entire picture. And there's a lot of workout and dietary approaches and especially weight loss approaches that are based on a mechanicalistic approach, but it oftentimes can leave you very vulnerable to setbacks and frustration and lots of plateaus or even regression if you're not too careful. So there you go, formulistic approach, find your numbers, get in the ballpark, but then don't be afraid to mix, match, adjust, and change to find what works best for you. Let's get into some questions here, everybody. How's it going? I hope everybody's geared up for the new year. Let's start one off here with Al Painter. Al, hey Matt, is the new found power on the bike better neural recruitment or new strength gains from the program. So Al was uh, messaging me the other day that he just climbed a 23% hill on his mountain bike, which is damn near vertical. Uh, in the mountain biking world, in, a, in other words, you got the stem right in your in your chest when you climb stuff like that. So he's asking uh, when he's got more power, is it uh, neural or strength gains from uh, the program? It's probably a little bit of both. Uh, usually when we're getting an improvement in performance, especially in something like biking, there's a lot of pieces that are coming together for that. So strength gains from the program can, again, be neural. Uh, so a lot of times when we improve our strength, nothing's happening so much with our muscle. It's just our brain learning how to use more motor units, therefore engaging more muscle fibers in a very uh, patterned and organized way to produce more force. We're not actually changing anything about the muscle itself. It's a uh, improvement in the nervous system. So probably that. It could also be very well uh, improvement in your technique because of some of the things you were doing. If you're improving your stability during the program that I gave you, that can very well be the case. Lots of times when it comes to uh, hard things like going up hills and stuff, hip strength is a big part of it. A lot of times mountain bikers, when they have trouble generating smooth power and rugged terrains because their hips aren't engaged very much, they have very choppy, uh, uneven sort of uh, pedal strokes, uh, very hard to ride in steep terrain or very uh, high uh, altitude and so on. And we got a lot of that out here in Colorado. There's a lot of trails out here uh, that we affectionately call shit hill. Like every area has got that one shit hill because it's steep and it's rocky and sandy and it's just really, really hard to ride. Uh, so it's basically like, can you get up it? And it, it requires more than strength. It requires being very smooth. Nebular, good question here. Hey, Matt, congrats on the new book. Thank you very much. What's your thoughts on jogging versus sprinting? Well, it kind of, again, it depends on what kind of a stimulus are you trying to create in your workouts. You're going to be creating kind of uh, bookend stimuli. So with jogging, you are going with low intensity, long duration of time. Okay? With sprinting, it's the opposite. High intensity, short duration of time. So think of this as like high endurance, strength training, high rep, low weight versus low weight or low rep, high weight kind of stuff. So what are you trying to get out of your running? Now with sprinting, a lot of times sprints are best for people who need power and explosiveness in sport, like football players, uh, even soccer players to a large degree. Anyone's got to put the gas on real quick and fast. Uh, sprinting is really good. Sprinting also has much more of an intense uh, metabolic effect. And a lot of people swear that sprinting is just the way to go because it takes less time. It takes uh, less overall energy and stuff. Jogging can be very good from kind of a therapeutic standpoint. It just gets you out of the house and you're like, oh, I just turn my phone off and I've got an hour or half an hour or whatever to just zone out and just let my thoughts run and stuff like that. So basically it boils down to do you need intensity or do you need time for what you're trying to accomplish? Longer time typically is higher calorie burn and just time away and you're burning more energy, not just physical energy, but mental and emotional energy, right? And sprinting is more intensity, strength, power, uh, performance, that sort of thing. So it really, like I said, depends on what you are after for that. Michael in the house, drop weight daddy. Hey Matt, 
I used the hen method during my journey. Very good, Michael. Uh, that's one of those things that uh, for measuring uh, protein and everything, uh, it's like, can you use like something that is related to you? So like with um, what he's referring to, I'm assuming, uh, is like how much protein you use. Like, well, roughly like one fist size. That's how much of a por portion size you would use for protein. So it could be meat, it could be beans and rice, tempeh, tofu, whatever, like one fist. And I like things like that because it helps you customize your own like situation. Like if you're bigger, you need more in your diet. So your hand is naturally going to be bigger versus if you have uh, someone who's smaller, then that's going to be smaller. So things like that are really good. Uh, uh, also along those lines is recommendations that take uh, your personal characteristics into account, like your body weight or an estimation of your activity level, things like that, you're gonna get a little bit more accurate. So if you said, how many calories should I burn? I don't know, but if you plug in your height, your body weight, how much lean mass you have, and a rough estimate of your activity level, you're probably gonna get a much more uh, accurate ballparkian number than if you just like, I'm 27 and I'm six foot two. Okay, that's not going to be nearly as, as accurate. Plus, if you ever want to find numbers on the internet, I always recommend going with at least several sources and then taking an average. Like BMR is a good example uh, where people would be like, what's my BMR? Well, do it at least several sites because it's like one BMR is 2,300. The next one is 1,700. And the next one is higher and lower. So take several numbers, average it out, and that's probably going to be a lot closer to what you actually need as well. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Zabe. Hey, Matt. Excited for the new book. Thank you. We'll be purchasing this tomorrow. Whoop, whoop. Any tips for self-sabotage? I know what I should do. I know what I should eat. I am not doing it, though. Oh, you are preaching to the choir there, Zabe. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. The um, self-sabotage is very, very common. And a lot of times it stems from some sort of emotional drive because make no mistake about it like what we know in our heads like the logic and the knowledge that we carry to the plate or into the gym is like that much of the game it's a very small thing because ultimately your decisions are going to be based on how you feel rather than what you know like if someone brings in a dozen donuts to your workplace on friday how you feel about those donuts is going to be much more of an influence on whether you eat, you, not you eat donuts versus what you know about donuts. Same thing with exercise. Like I know everything there is to know about calisthenics. I just can't stick with it. Well, how do you feel about calisthenics then? And a lot of times what ends up happening is people are just trying to do way too much. They're trying to push themselves way too hard. There was a comment on the YouTube channel I saw today where the individual was saying, ah, oh, you know, I just can't get back in shape. I was in the best shape of my life at this time in my life. So I know what to do. I just can't make myself do it. I was like, you're probably pushing too hard. You're probably stressing out your mind and your body. And you're just going 100 miles an hour when you should be scaling it back to like 40. And again, that's the joy of micro workouts and the strategy that I have in my book. It gives you permission to say, don't go all out. Don't go 100 miles an hour with everything you've got. Like, it's perfectly fine to scale back. In fact, I'm a big fan of not putting it all out there. You know, in the financial world, one of the most sound principal pieces of advice is live below your means. So if you make $10,000 a month, live on like $8,000 a month and save and invest the other two grand, right? Live below your means. Well, the same exact thing works for fitness, Live below your means. Don't push yourself as hard as you can all the time. Don't make your diet as strict and uh, restrictive as possible. Don't push yourself as hard as you can every single day because you're just going to burn out and you're going to collapse. So scale back. Like Take the habits that you're struggling to stick with. Cut them in half. Cut the workout in half. Cut the sets in half. Cut the reps in half. What are the rules you're trying to follow for diet? Okay, maybe pick one or two rather than five right? Just one or two things and ease into it because the whole sequence or the strategy of being consistent isn't about going hundred miles an hour. If you get in your car and you're like, I'm going to drive 60 miles an hour, no matter what, you're eventually going to crash or you're going to get pulled over. Like I did the other day, I got a speeding ticket, damn it. But trying to go hundred percent all out all the time is not going to work very well in your favor. Even though you're like, I know this is what I need to be doing. Yeah. But is it? 
Again, that's that formulaic approach. Should you really be doing those? Second guess some of those things. Second guess those approaches. Because if you're having trouble sticking to it, it's a bad program. You know, do you have any idea how many times coaches have come to me saying like, oh, this person would get great in great shape if they would just follow the damn program. If they would do the diet as I laid it out, if I did, if they did the program as I laid it out, I'm like, dude, if they're not following your diet or workout program, then your program sucks. That's the bottom line. Because as trainers and coaches, our job is to create programs and diets that meet the person where they are. Okay. If you come in and you say, I want to get stronger and this is the only time and the energy and skills I have, I have to make my program fit your circumstances. I can't say, okay, you've got to be doing this and in an ideal world that would happen. But if you're struggling to stick with it, it's a bad program. I don't care what the numbers are. I don't care what the science behind it is. If you're struggling to stick with it or apply it, it's a bad program because that's the first rule that it has to follow is it has to be something that you can follow and maintain with relative ease. And again, that's the whole idea with micro workouts. People don't trust the micro workout idea of doing less because they're like, it's too easy. It's supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be relatively low effort. That doesn't mean it's always going to be like that. Sometimes you're going to feel like you get into this cycle and you're like full steam ahead, baby, like pedal to the floor. I got a clean line ahead of me, route 66, straight and smooth as far as the eye can see. Then yeah, floor it and go as hard as you can in those opportune moments. But don't try to apply that approach all the time. If you're in rush hour traffic and you've got to kind of pick and choose and go at a slower pace, then do that. But the point is you keep making a forward progress. All right. I'm drowning on a little bit. Thank you for <laughs> listening to all that sort of thing. Like question here. Brian K. Hey, Matt. Shroom squats are a humbling experience. Yes, they are. They're really illuminating mobility issues in my legs. Very good. Can they help to correct these issues with me? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, Ryan, absolutely. Remember the basic fundamental principle in exercise. You gain that which you challenge, right? So if it's challenging your mobility, if it's challenging your stability, if it's challenging imbalances, then it's exactly what's going to be good for improving these sorts of things. And shrimp squats, I really like for this sort of thing because the basic shrimp squat gives you a um, – a stopping block with your knee coming down to the floor. And then you can move up to jumbo shrimp squats where you're coming down below because you're standing on some sort of an elevated uh, platform. So the fact that it's highlighting these things and making more aware of it shows that you're on the right track. Congratulations. New one from Justin Stone. Hey, Matt, how did you fix your knee problems using calisthenics? Thanks for everything you do. Because yes, I've had loads of knee issues. My knee issues started when I was about 13 and continued all the way into my late 30s. And uh, largely, this is just me being stupid <laughs> to a large degree. Uh, one of my first workout programs that I did because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't have any equipment or anything was just go out for runs. And I started going out for runs and I had a little bit of external rotation in my right leg due to uh, when I was born. My right leg was actually externally rotated 90 degrees. And I spent the first nine months of my life in a cast to try and get my foot straight, but it wasn't quite perfect naturally. So as I was running, I had a little bit of external rotation with every step, caused some knee issues, and basically that was something that uh, plagued me for most of my life. With calisthenics, what ended up happening was, same thing as Ryan's situation there, was when I started doing more unilateral stuff, uh, lunges, split squats, pistol squats, and so on, it highlighted those issues. Like every time I would start doing work on my right leg. It's like my toes are pointing out to the side. My knee breaks out to the side. Like I keep shifting to my left because suddenly I was doing exercise that required more technical proficiency. It was highlighting those imbalances that I had. And now I couldn't hide those imbalances in like a leg press that I would be using or a leg extension machine and stuff. And as a result, I became more aware of it. And then I started to apply a lot more shift work, things like in grind style calisthenics, like, oh, wow, that's, I would shift to the left, feels good, shift to the right, ooh, that is tight, that is really weak, okay, uh, that area, and basically it was like right side, left side, right side, left side, try to get them the same, and over time they become much more even, and of course, the more I was able to get the stress to go through my legs in a more 
holistic nature, the less stress there was on my knees, and it uh, took care of it right there. Another one from Al Painter. Hey, Matt, kids were psyched for the match show. They love watching. What is one thing you'd like to see change in the fitness world 2021? Less hit, more <laughs> least mode. I love that. I'm totally going to use that hashtag now. That is awesome, man. That's fantastic. Least mode versus beast mode. New book is great, by the way. Thank you very much, Al. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that we're experiencing now that we're going to see carry over into 2021 is a lot more <clears throat> need for customization rather than just blanket programs. Like I was saying, like just random stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I think now with the pandemic and stuff, we're starting to get a lot more remote coaching, remote training, remote this, remote that. Like naturally, sure, because that's what most people can do. But I think we're starting to also realize a lot of the drawbacks to that, like the drawbacks to remote training and coaching. And at the end of the day, there's just no substitution to one-on-one -on -one experience like even this degree like what we're doing here now sure you're in front of your computer i'm in front of my computer but at least we can communicate with one another one-on-one -on -one. and it's even better if we're in person because you can learn more in person with a coach or a therapist or someone in five minutes than you can do searching the internet in five years because they can look exactly what's going on they say you need to do this you fix it and you're like, great, and there you go. So I think we're gonna see more of an emphasis on the personalized one-on-one -on -one services, hopefully. Uh, there's been a lot of gyms that have closed down in my area here, uh, understandably so. There's been a lot of personal trainers who have gone and done other work. So I'd like to see that start to make a bit of a comeback. Uh, but I am excited for home training. I'm excited for people who are just working out more at home. And I would really like to see just people getting more comfortable with exercising at home, you know, working out at home. For years, we've been told that the gym is where you get your workouts in. And the way I see it is exercise and training the body is no different than hygiene and taking care of yourself and cleanliness and a hundred other things that we do to keep ourselves healthy. Now, you would, you would naturally not think I have to always leave the house <clears throat> and go somewhere special and pay a membership to brush my teeth, to do my laundry, to uh, be able to just wash my clothes or, or a hundred other things that we do just to keep our health and hygiene, right? So I'm excited that home fitness is becoming more prevalent, but I also would like to see uh, less of a reliance on tech. Uh, again, we can't engineer fitness, and I think we're going to start running into the limits of that. Like, oh, there's all these you know tech ways of uh, apps on phones and everything like that. And it's it's just, there's so many shortcomings with it that we didn't really see coming uh, at the beginning of 2020. <clears throat> All right, let's see what else we got here. I had a couple more. For your futuristic old school, again, best username on the internet, man. Fantastic. When are you releasing another book? We need it. I just did yesterday or two days ago, if memory serves me. Micro workouts, you can find it in the link down below or just look up micro workouts on YouTube. Uh, there's that one and there's another book by that title called The Micro Workout Solution by Tom Holland. I haven't read it, but uh, I've uh, come across a lot of Tom Holland stuff and I highly recommend that as well. Varun Krish, very good. Is there a strategy we should use when training if our calisthenics goal is mobility and flexibility? Um, basically, just whatever exercises require mobility and flexibility. So I, I included a special section in the book on these daily little mobility habits that I practice that I recommend everyone practice. And they're literally like nothing. They're practically nothing to practice. I mean, hell, you wouldn't even know I'm practicing half the time if you even saw me. And uh, basically any sort of movement that tests and pushes your range of motion is going to be good for your mobility and flexibility. So some of my favorites that I include in the book is deep squats and lunges. And that'll basically take care of your lower body right there. Uh, reaching overhead. So clasp your hands, reach up overhead as high as you can and twist. So put a hand on a shoulder, one hand behind your back and twist around. Uh, very similar to the trifecta in convict conditioning too. That's a good one to go with as well. And I mean, just those three things, you do those here and there throughout the day, that'll take care of the vast majority of flexibility and mobility you're ever going to need 
on a functional way. Now, is that like, you know, 180 degree Van Dam splits between two chairs? No, no. But when it comes to mobility that you actually benefit from and need and use on a daily basis and will unlock a lot of exercises for you while removing a lot of stiffness and achiness and pain and stuff, those three things will pretty much just take care of you right there. It doesn't take a whole lot. Wild honey, good question. Hey Matt, do you recommend people fast while doing calisthenics? You can go fast or slow, whichever you prefer. I know, bad joke, I'm sorry. Um, no, I mean, well, technically yes, because it's really a pain in the butt to eat while doing push-ups. You know, I guess you could put a plate of spaghetti there and just kind of go down and, and grab a mouthful of spaghetti while you're doing push-ups. But again, I know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, be in a fasted state and sort of thing. No, I mean, fasting is one of those things that has its place in its application, but it's also terribly overrated. Like for the most part, most people will be in the same place if they fast or they didn't fast kind of thing. Uh, so as always, I always say, pay attention to your energy level though. Uh, fasting is one of those things I find is very polarizing as far as energy for a lot of people. Some people fast and their energy goes through the roof and that's gonna help your workouts. Some people fast and their energy level craters. That's my experience. Oh man, it's the worst thing. That's not going to help. So let your energy level be your guide. Uh, doing it fasted, doing it with a little bit of something in your system, which one gives you the most energy so that you can put in your best performance. That's what you want to go with. D dash. Thoughts on meal, frequent, meal frequency. Is eating three meals counterproductive to building muscle? Should be eating more frequently throughout the day? Meal frequency is one of those things that for the most part isn't gonna matter one tiny little bitty iota uh, for most people. Uh, again, energy level may be a contributing factor. Some people are like, I eat twice a day, I feel great. Other people are grazers like myself. Like I eat throughout the day and that's how I keep my energy level up. Um, but again, let the experience uh, be your guide. See what type of eating uh, frequency makes you feel your best and on point. That's really where you're looking for. Because uh, above all, a good healthy diet should make you feel energized and good for your workouts. That's one of the four appetites of uh, a healthy diet. Again, I explained that in my book, Micro Workouts. If your dietary habits are leaving you hungry, lethargic, and craving foods, it's not a healthy diet. Uh, but if it's me leaving you feeling good energy and satisfied and you can bring a lot to your workouts, then you're on the right track. But again, it's that number thing. Like there are tons of people out there say, this is the number of times you should be eating throughout the day. And people are forcing themselves to eat at a frequency that may not be best for them just because some experts said it or they were like, look at the science and look at this research. Like, I don't care what the research says. If you said that eating twice a day is the best and I feel like crap eating twice a day, I'm not eating twice a day. It's based on your own experience and results that you should base your decisions off of. Use things like that for ideas instead. Next question, help. Love the avatar with the kitty cat. <laughs> I'm at, I've been trying to incorporate overcoming isometrics in order to improve my strength, but can't seem to find a good way to implement it with my legs. Any tips or techniques? One of my favorites is the uh, the iso loop lunges. I mean, that's just shooting fish in a barrel way to just obliterate the hell out of your legs. So if you look on my YouTube channel, I've got uh, iso loop exercises, kind of like the iso loop video library, the lunge variant where you put the loop underneath your foot, or you can do this with a yoga strap. And I know people have jerry-rigged it with like gymnastics ring straps and stuff. And you just throw it over your shoulder and down the other shoulder to your side. Then you lean forward and you press up against that like you're trying to stand up out of a lunge, fries your legs real quick. Other good ones are the wall sit, uh, where you push your tailbone into the wall as hard as you can. That'll get your quads really lit up. And of course, the glute bridge, where you pull into your heels as hard as you possibly can to really light up your hamstrings. Those are the ways uh, that I would go about that. Harper, 1994. I'm at, I have hypermobility. Is there anything in your books can help navigate over extension issues I have? Thank you from Australia. So with, when it comes to hypermobility, it always still boils down to control, keeping tension in the muscles. Lots of times when I would see people with hypermobility in like the elbows, the knees and stuff, what ends up happening is they go to a place where 
they have range of motion at the joint, but they don't have any tension in the muscles. And as a result, it's on the joint, the, the stress is on the joint, they're just kind of sitting there. So uh, it's not bad to have the mobility, uh, but you want to make sure you're still working in that mobility. You still have tension in the muscles for those. So move in whatever range of motion you can for your strength that you can keep tension in the muscles. As long as you have tension in the muscles, you're fine because uh, that's what is keeping you safe is your your muscles give you control. They take the stress out of the joints and that's what uh, also improves things like your performance and results as well. All right, fantastic questions. Ryan K. Hey Matt, just purchased the Kensui weight vest. Very good. By adding small loads while doing those unilateral exercises, how much should I worry about over stretching things or will it help to gain mobility? I'd say it's probably gonna help to gain mobility. Uh, once again, Ryan, it's all about, is there tension in the muscle? As long as you got tension in the muscle, you're safe. You're probably pretty good. It's when, like if you're doing a squat and you're like, I got tension, I got tension, and then you lose tension and you just kind of sit or like a dead hang in pull-ups and stuff like that. Uh, it's not necessarily always bad, but remember my motto, no tension, no benefit. Like there, if there's no tension in the muscle, then what good is it doing you? So you want to make sure that you can maintain tension in the muscle. But as long as you got that, yeah, go for as much mobility as you like. Doing uh, mobility-based strength work with external loads or, or weight like weight vests and stuff like that is a classic old school technique. And it works really, really well. Because one of the things about mobility that often goes unaddressed is what I call that muscle confidence. That ability for the muscle to feel relaxed and strong in those extended ranges of motion. So that whole idea of like, I'm trying to relax the muscle and turn it off and stuff, that's not what we want. We want at least a little tension because as long as the muscle feels strong and secure because it has tension in it, it's going to allow a greater range of motion. Let's see what else we got here. I know I skipped over a few questions. Apologize if did that. There we go. Most pure. Hey Matt, in grind style, should I do tension phase for each chain, then stability and so on, or complete all four phases for a chain before doing next chain? This is a very common question I get, and I'm going to be addressing this one for sure uh, in the next edition of Grind Style Calisthenics. Uh, next year, that's my goal for Red Delta Project is to come out with updated versions of all my books. But anyway, you can do it either way. Uh, you can do all the tension and then all the stability. You can superset back and forth. Uh, it's really not that much of a difference one way or the other. Some people prefer the tension first just because it allows their mind to stay fixated on one type of stimulus and then they change over to the mobility and the stability phase. Uh, other people like to do it with um, tension and stability of a single chain because then you're dialed into one chain and then you change over to another chain. And so you could do it either way. It's not like it's not going to work uh, either way because you're still getting the same work done either way. Uh, but experiment and see what works best for you. <clears throat> Tyler, hey Matt, over the holiday, I got thinking. That's a good thing. I think it's very good for you. Do you think we worry too much about being optimal with our workouts? Most of us really need to be optimal all the time. You hit the nail right on the head, Tyler. You are absolutely right. Uh, optimization is something that uh, I think is terribly overrated. Uh, I think most people have no access whatsoever to optimal. And it's, again, this is something that people talk about with micro workouts and the easier approaches. And they're like, this isn't optimal. There's no way you're going to get the best possible results with this. I'm like, yeah, well, you're not going to get the best possible results with whatever else you're doing. I can almost guarantee you that. Because if you really want to go all out, uh, the joke I always say is move to the Olympic Training Center here in Colorado Springs. Have a team of coaches helping you. Have a personal chef and a nutritionist and someone who coaches your strength training and someone who specializes in your performance and dedicate your life to optimizing your results. Because if you really want optimal, that's what we're talking about, right? That's There's a reason why professional athletes are paid is because they don't have time for a job. They are dedicating their life to whatever their performance is, right? So you're absolutely right. We're so focused on trying to optimize or maximize our results that we're not allowing ourselves the flexibility 
to scale back to do the things that we're actually going to do. Like I was saying earlier, like we're trying to go 100 miles an hour when the thing we should be doing is 40 miles an hour because that's the safest and most reliable way to just keep making progress and keep moving forward. And if you can ramp up to 100 later on, go for it. And if you got to slow down, slow it down. But when we've got that mindset of fixated on what's the maximum way, you're only giving yourself one speed you can possibly go at. And that's going to cause you a ton of stress because you've given yourself one of two options. You either break even and you are able to satisfy whatever your requirements are, or you're going to lose. It's kind of like, I never understood it in school. Like I had friends who were like, I have to get an A every single time. It's like, you're, you're either going to break even and, and meet your objectives, or you're going to feel like a failure. And personally for me in school, I had to get at least a B minus. So in the B, that was good. If I got an A, great. I had extra, like, that was awesome. I felt like a million dollars if I got an A on something. C, okay, that's not acceptable. Bring it back up. And as a result, I only got one C in my entire college career. Um, it was due to a misunderstanding even on my part. I didn't uh, turn in an assignment. So it's the same thing with fitness. Like, what's the extra level that you can go to? But what's your medium ground that you can hit to most of the time? Is it going to be maximal? Is it going to be optimal? No. But that's not going to get you where you want to go either because you get to the results you want, not by optimizing or maximizing, just moving forward. And I don't care if you're going 30 miles an hour or 100 miles an hour, moving forward is the important thing. And you don't automatically move forward because you're going 100 miles an hour. All right, lecture over. Sorry, I got that one already. Side. So good to see you again, man. Hey, Matt, do you think one gram of protein per pound of body weight is necessary? Thanks for taking time to educate us. My pleasure, as always. Uh, hell if I know. <laughs> Again, this is one of those things about a formulaic approach. Uh, it, there's so many things that go into the picture as far as requirements uh, go that it's a guess uh, either way. Um, basically, the recommendations I have is once, uh, again, for your protein and stuff is make sure you're getting at each meal. Follow your three Ps. Plant protein and portion. Make sure you're getting at least those three taken care of with each meal you do. Good protein source. Get it consistent too. So you have a rough idea of how much protein you're getting and it's a relatively consistent intake. And then, because really when people are asking about numbers, they don't really care about numbers. They're just saying, should I do more or less than what I'm doing now? And so that's when you experiment and be like, okay, I'm going to do more. So you have two chicken breasts instead of one. How much protein is that? Damn if I know. I don't need to know. I just know it's a lot more than usual. And then you pay attention to like, did it make a difference? Does it make you feel better? Does it make you feel more filled, uh, satisfied? Does it satisfy your hunger? Does it give you energy? Like you're looking for a positive outcome out of that. And if you don't notice anything, chances are it's not really that important. A result should be pretty self-evident. Like I doubled up, you know, how much protein I had at lunch and I felt great all afternoon. Good. There's your evidence right there. Good. <laughs> Keep going with that. How much protein is that? Damn, I don't know. You know, we don't eat numbers. We eat portions. We eat amounts of things. So should it be more or less? Well, get consistent, then increase. See what happens. There you go. All right. Let's see what else if I missed anything. <laughs> People saying it's four o'clock in Germany. Oh, man. What are you doing up then? <laughs> what are you What are you on the on the computer for? My my uh, condolences if you're up uh, can't sleep. That sucks. Sleep is so critical, critical, important, especially when it comes to health and fitness. Chris uh, Chris Grant, hey Matt, I want to get bigger forearms. Do you have any recommendations for exercises, etc.? Uh, absolutely, anything that challenges your grip. So your forearm muscles are your grip muscles. Right, right in here, grip, primarily like this. Now, the overcoming isometric I always recommend is make a fist and flex and then open your hand and extend. So you're you're really working your forearm like this with an isometric. You do that you know, several times a day, holding for about 15 seconds each uh, position. That can really help. Anything that's hanging is going to be really good. Uh, things that require pulling are really heavy, like farmer walks are good, rows, pull-ups using implements that challenge your grip. So one of the classics out of combat conditioning too is of course just towels. Hanging from towels is really good. Um, the Duonomic company just came out with these power holds 
where you can hold on. It's like a climbing grip. Rock rings are really good. Anything that challenges your grip is going to build your forearms, bottom line. So find something that makes your grip work, and that's going to build up your forearms. Um, I'm a big fan of integrating things into your training. So instead of incorporating separate grip work, uh, do uh, some of your rows and stuff like that on with towels and stuff. So that way you're working your grip and your back and your biceps and all that other sort of thing. So that way you're getting more bang for your buck from the same amount of work and effort. Zach Moriarty, hey Matt, how can one integrate cardio into workouts in general without worrying the fact that I might lose muscle? So this is a really good one. Uh, Cardio, for the most part, has gotten quite a bit demonized, uh, and rightfully so in the muscle building world, because there is a bit of a correlation between cardio and muscle loss. But, this is the big but, it takes a lot of cardio to have that interference. And the reason for that is, yeah, there's energy substrate you know, going on if you're an ultra marathoner and all these sorts of things where you're burning off muscles and stuff. But for the most part, cardio is perfectly fine. It's not going to compromise your gains whatsoever. But the thing you want to pay attention to is, is your cardio exercise compromising your strength training exercise and recovery? So as a bike racer, right, if I rode a lot more and raced a lot more, I wouldn't be doing nearly as much strength training just because I've got the time and energy going towards my riding and racing. So that could compromise my ability to maintain my muscle just because I'm not working out as much. But when you were asking about incorporating cardio in, right, jump rope, kettlebell swings, uh, explosive calisthenics like jumping, uh, burpees and stuff like that, sled drags. If you're at a place where you can push a sled around, hill sprints, these sorts of things are not going to compromise your ability to build muscle one iota. If anything, they're going to enhance it these short, hard, intense bouts, right? Like the sprints we were talking about. When you go more on the short uh, and intense end of the spectrum, if anything, it's gonna help you. So keep it relatively short, like 60 seconds or so, and something that you can really put a lot of effort into. It's gonna jack your heart rate up real quick. Um, attack bikes, uh, things of that nature. You, you know what I'm talking about with, with stuff like this. It's not the long, slow distance that people usually associate cardio with. Um, that's what you want to typically avoid. So uh, have fun with it. It's good. It's good conditioning. Mary Elizabeth, hey, Matt, what's a good minimalist beginner workout? Whatever you can do now. You know, be beginner workouts, there's this myth out there that there's such a thing as a beginner workout. Uh, that this is what you should do if you're a beginner. But the fact of the matter is everybody's different as a beginner. Like I've had beginners who can do uh, front levers and pistol squats as a beginner, you know, because they've got some other experience, right? Um, I've also had people who came to me who are beginners and they could barely get out of a chair. You know, as a trainer and a coach, I don't train people based on their experience level. I train them on their capability. So if you can bang out one arm push-ups, I'm going to train you as someone who can bang out one-arm push-ups. I don't care if you're a, quote, beginner, right? Versus, uh, you know, if you have trouble getting out of a chair, well, we're going to start there. So take stock of what you can do now. And always remember that beginning workouts and advanced workouts are almost exactly the same on a fundamental level. Like if you go and take a martial arts class, you're going to learn a handful of techniques in the first week. And if you fast forward the string of time, 20 years in the future, and you're a black belt and you're teaching in your own school, I would bet money you're still doing those exact same techniques, only you're doing them extremely well, right? That's the difference between an expert and a beginner is they do the same thing, but they do it at a much higher level of proficiency. So push-ups, rows, squats, lunges, planks, leg raises, all the exercises that I have like in grind style calisthenics and stuff, those are where you're going to start. And then just start with wherever you can go whatever level you can do. And, uh, you know, like I said, don't feel like you got to go hundred miles an hour if you're at level four in grind style calisthenics, but it's a real pisser to get that, uh, level done and go to three most of the time. And sometimes you're like, I'm feeling great today. Well, then go to four. <coughs> Everything is adjustable. The big, biggest thing is we don't want to get stuck. And when you're dogmatic, you're stuck. I don't care if it's right. <laughs> you're stuck. That's the biggest problem that you can, uh, fall into. All right. A couple more questions here, folks. Thanks so much for coming on. I know everybody's ramping up for the new year. 
probably have lots of parties and stuff that we're getting out to, or at least Zoom parties and stuff. Strong at the rim. Hey, Matt, when, uh, when doing a push-up, how do I make my chest do the work? Do I need to push with the chest or my arms? Sorry if you already answered. No, this is a very good question. In fact, I don't think I've ever gotten this question before. Very insightful. Um, it's both, naturally. You want to be using both. And a lot of times when we don't have chest activation, it's because we don't have that scapular movement and control. So when you're at the bottom of your push-up, your shoulders are all the way back and down. So you're basically stretching out this motion here from your shoulder to your pec. And that's any hand position. And then as you come up, your shoulder comes forward and in. And that's where a lot of your pec activation is going to be. So keep it in tight with the arms, squeezing everything in, squeezing the hands in, and uh, that's going to get your chest fully engaged. And again, yes, definitely use your triceps. Shoulders, chest, triceps. Use everything. Remember, integrate. Don't isolate. And that's how we want to make sure we're doing things uh, in the most holistic, safest, and most effective way possible. William. Hey, Matt, would you recommend doing micro-workouts as a supplement for an initial training program or use micro-workouts only, maybe more than one workout a day or something? You could do it either way, man. It's a great thing about fitness is it's open source. You can train however you want. Key point is however you want, right? Again, this is getting away from the dogmatic formulaic approaches of like, what's the best way I do it? Well, chances are, you know, a lot of times when people – come to me and they're like, I feel like I kind of want to do it this way. I want to do it this other way. A lot of times they're right. Now, not always. Sometimes people come to the table and they've got this preconceived notion of what is most important, like uh, just burning themselves out with a lot of cardio in order to burn fat and stuff. But to a large degree, when people are saying, I think I want to make this change in my program to work out this way because it's going to help me work on this and that and stuff. I, a lot of times they're correct. In fact, as a coach, you'd be amazed how much of my programming depends on what the suggestions are from my fellow clients. From my client, If they're like, I feel like I want to do this and that, I'm like, great, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Let's try that for a week or two and see what happens. And then based on that feedback, they're like, that was great, but we came into this issue. Okay, well, I can help you with that issue. And that's how those great programs get dialed in is because we basically move on with that sort of approach. I go, G. Hey, Matt, when I'm doing bridge work, my thighs are getting burned out way before my back glutes and hamstrings, really concentrating on that chain when my upper legs get destroyed. Any tips? Well, uh, it could be that you're pushing too much forward into your feet. So when you're doing that, it's kind of like you're doing a wall sit where you're pushing forward and it's an isometric extension. Now, granted, you're quads are certainly involved in bridges as you're pushing yourself up, but try pulling more into your heels. Uh, that's kind of the way to go about it. The, the bridge motion, uh, it doesn't look like it on paper, but it's actually a pulling exercise. You're actually pulling your shoulders back towards your heels. That's kind of what the bridge motion is. So uh, if you focus on that, it should be more on the backside Quads are certainly going to be there. And the other thing is, too, it just may be that your quads are the weak link in the chain and they just need to get stronger. But I would bet money that you're pushing a little bit too much into the toes, pushing forward into your feet, pull into those heels that may take care of you. Evan Barron, good to see you again. Hey, Matt, is it unhealthy to solely focus on lower body strength versus keeping things relatively equal, both upper and lower? I've definitely been skipping arm, torso, Above the waist day. Hey, man, I would say that's a better one to skip than people who skip leg day. That's for damn sure. Um, I don't think it's good to skip and neglect, but you can certainly have focus. Like, yeah, crush the legs, do it like 90% of stuff, legs, 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 but give yourself a few sets of push-ups and pull-ups or rows or something just to give you something, a little bit of something. Even in my book, uh, Bodyweight Training for Cycling, which is like 90% core legs and extension chain or hamstrings and glutes. Because as a cyclist and a runner, that's like 90% of what you need. You really don't need much upper body with that. But I do include basic rows and push-ups in that program just because it is good to balance things out. Uh, so don't neglect. You can certainly emphasize and focus, but keep it in there to at least some degree. Another one from Wild Honey. Hey, Matt. 
you think one should eat an exclusive alkaline diet? No, uh, don't worry too much about it. I've uh, asked this one a lot of my nutrition professors in school. Back when I was in college, uh, you know, alkalinity and everything like that was a very big topic of making the rounds. So I was asking a lot of my nutrition professors and they all basically were like, don't worry about it. Your body is really good at maintaining your pH balance all on its own. Uh, if it's not and things are really alkaline or acidic, uh, that's need to go see a doctor, <laughs> a health professional. It's not something for a diet. Your, di your body's very good at being able to maintain its pH balance all on its own. You don't need to worry too much about uh, that sort of thing. Ballage business. Hey, Matt. If I, if I am weighing 80 kilograms, is it okay to eat 50, 60 grams of protein to build muscle? If I try to eat more, I usually have digestive issues. What's your suggestion? Well, there you go, man. If you're having digestive issues, um, I would look at what you're eating though. Uh, what uh, sources of protein are you consuming uh, in order to, uh, uh, to get that sort of thing? Because 50 to 60 for 80 kilograms, that is a little on the lower side of recommendations that people have. So you may be well off getting more if you can, but not at the expense of other things. Like people are like, oh, I'm getting my optimal numbers. Yeah, but you're compromising something else greatly. Like, oh, I'm getting my best uh, diet here, but I'm always hungry and I'm always craving and I feel terrible. Then no, it's not a good diet. So I would look at what you're eating uh, that's causing you that. Um, even different sources of some of those foods. Uh, there was a time once when I kept eating uh, uh, some... Uh, uh, steak from uh, a vendor. And every time I ate this, I just didn't feel, I don't know what it was with this grass fed steak, but it did not make me feel very big digestive issues. So I would change what you're eating and see if that resolves it. I don't think it's the amount of protein that's doing it. Henry Reed again, any thoughts on meal timing? How soon should you eat after completing a strength workout, optimal intake, yada, yada, yada. Again, uh, probably not something we have to really worry about. Uh, meal intake is one of those things that can make a difference, but only once you've got like 99% of everything else in your diet perfect. Uh, like again, those Olympic athletes at the training center, uh, meal timing may matter, but uh, for the vast majority of Joe Schmoes like us, don't worry too much about it. In that case, uh, base it again, more on your personal experience. Like, oh, I eat right after a workout and I feel so much better versus if I don't eat after a workout, I get tired and hungry and lethargic half an hour later. Like let things like that be more of your guide, like uh, based on when do you eat, when do you feel your best, but uh, don't worry too much about it. Uh, a lot of, lot of, again, formulaic approaches out there saying, this is the timing you have to have on things. And nine times out of 10, it's not gonna matter one little tiny bit for 99.9% .9 of people on out there. David Baker, man, if I'm doing grease the groove for pull-ups, should I not do uh, re -pull, uh, RE pull-ups during my regular workout routine? No, definitely keep them in uh, for sure. Uh, again, pay attention to how the muscles are feeling though. Like if you're starting to feel lethargic and the muscles are not able to bring a lot of juice in the workout, like, oh man, I can usually get 15 pull-ups and lately I'm struggling to get eight. Okay, scale it back. Uh, scale back to grease the groove. Again, the grease the groove is great for proficiency, but are you doing a proficiency workout or a capacity workout? Uh, proficiency workout is you're just trying to improve how well you do it. Capacity workout is how much you can do, how many reps or how much weight and stuff like that. So in your regular workout, if you're pushing your capacity and it's a capacity workout, that's a different stimulus. And you still want to do that because you're not going to get that so much from grease the groove. Uh, so that's what you want to be looking at is stimulus of capacity versus proficiency. Let's see, one more, one more. Sorry, I thought I missed one here. There we go. Razor Flood, am I any workout consistency at dice for someone with ADHD, I have a hard time focusing on my workouts and being consistent. Very good question here. This affects a lot of people. One is keep distractions at bay, more specifically, your phone. Put it in the locker, put it in another room, get rid of it. Uh, unless you're keeping your workout log on it, in which case I may suggest even going with like paper or something if you're working out at home, but get the distractions out of your environment. 
best workout environments are pretty minimalist and simple. Like the best gym I ever built was in my basement back when I lived in Vermont. And it was the basement. There was carpet on the floor, a stereo in the corner. And that was it. There wasn't anything down there in that basement. So I would oftentimes go down in that basement and just get lost. And <laughs> people upstairs would be like, are you coming up? Like, <laughs> are you, are you dead down there? Cause remember the thing with ADHD uh, and I have this as well. I'm speaking uh, from experience is that the, uh, biggest uh, conception about ADHD is that we're always left and right, left and right, up and down. We can't focus. But the other side of ADHD is that we get hyper-focused. Like we'll get so focused on a singular event or what's going on that everything around us just fades into the background. Like I was saying about my workouts, like I could just get lost in that basement and now would go by like that and I wouldn't even know. So get rid of the distractions in your environment if you can, specifically your phone. That's a big one. And also make sure you have a focused uh, approach to your workout. So every workout you do, make sure you're concentrating on increasing the stimulus in something. <clears throat> so this is, again, what I talk about in micro workouts. The whole point of your workout is to concentrate on improving how well you do something. So if you're going to your workout, I'm like, I'm just going through the motions. I'm just going to do the number of sets and reps I need to do. I'm just going to burn calories or whatever. There's nothing to concentrate on. So people get bored, people get ADHD, quote unquote, and they get distracted easy because they're not focusing on anything. Every workout you do, every set, every rep should require maximum focus and concentration. And a good way to tell that is if there's a distraction, it's unwelcome. Like if you're going to do a set and someone's like, hey, hey, I need to ask you a question. I'm like, shut up, hang on. You don't talk to me right now, right? That's the kind of concentration you want to have. It's like distractions are unwelcome. But if you're not focused and someone's like, oh, I need to ask you a question. You're like, yeah, what's up? You know, like, oh, please pull me away from whatever this is that I'm supposed to be doing, right? Have an ultra line focus of concentration on improving how well you can do the exercise for your proficiency, how much you can do. Because if you're trying to max out your reps, that should be like gun to the head kind of concentration and focus. Like I've got to be 100% focused. Pardon my kitty cat here. She needs her attention. <laughs> and um, or if you're just burning calories, that's something you can do kind of mindlessly. But chances are you're doing that during an activity that doesn't require a lot of focus. If you're walking on a treadmill, watching the game or something, that's that's no big deal. But those are the only three reasons to work out. Those are the only three stimuli that I talk about. It's one or the other. <clears throat> Steve Calamers, thoughts on wide grip inverted rows to highlight rear delts if lacking access to a suspension trainer. Yeah, for sure, man. But remember, the rear delts are turned on because you turn them on. Uh, don't be too concerned with your grip and width and all these sorts of things. Like if you want a muscle working, work it, turn it on, get the tension in there. Should be there regardless of your grip width or hand position. A uh, good way to practice is do a hang. Uh, so whatever hand position you like, get into a hang position. Turn on your biceps, lats, and rear delts. One of the secrets to your rear delts is get your lats on. Your lats and rear deltoids, they work together. Remember, a chain training, it's always about the muscles in along the same chain that make things work. So if your rear delts aren't working, it usually means a muscle above or below your biceps or your lats that aren't engaging enough. So I'm guessing anything, when you go wide grip, you're engaging your lats more, and that's what's lighting up your rear delts. So practice hanging with a various number of grips and uh, hand positions and tense up your entire pull chain, regardless of what it is. Because when you're really proficient at using a pull chain, the grip and the width and everything like that should be a fairly negligible effect. Let's see. All right, folks. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure as always. Uh, it's definitely, uh, again, the highlight of my week. I sincerely appreciate everybody coming on here as well. Don't forget, we do this every week. I know this week it was a little bit late because I had to work late. Uh, so I sincerely appreciate everybody's flexibility coming on a little bit later. And uh, the uh, topic again next week is the everything you think you know about fitness is wrong, part two, where we will be looking at the flaws in a mechanicalistic approach because a lot of theories and ideas out there are based on 
this is what happens with this enzyme or this protein or this amino acid or this hormone and everything. And they base the entire program thinking that's the entire picture when it really isn't. So I will uh, leave you in suspense for that. Don't forget, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Check out my new book, Micro Workouts on Kindle. Link is down below. And I'll talk to you guys next week. Till then, be